Hello there. Right, with that definition out of the way, let's dive in and let's look at what natural selection actually is. And let's see an example, because I think that's probably the best way we can understand how it works. So I've put a definition of both selection and natural selection on the slide for you here. The definition of natural selection is a complex process in which the total environment determines which members of a species survive to reproduce and so pass on their genes to the next generation. This need not necessarily involve a struggle between organisms. So <clears throat> long story short, what that really means is that the fittest organisms will produce the most offspring. And therefore, over time, they will start to dominate a population over those organisms that are less fit and their traits will spread through a population. A really good classic example of this is the peppered moth, a thing called Bison betularia. If you want to know the Latin name, doesn't really matter. But um, we have uh, two basic forms of this moth. There are... Um, the black and white peppered or the light form that you can see on the left hand image here and the carbonaria or the dark or melanistic form that you can see on the right hand side here. We know that this dark form here results from a single mutation within the genome of this organism. So we've got these two different forms of this moth, right? That is an example of variation within a population. So far, so good. So we also know that the light um, moth, when sitting on lichen-covered trees, for example, is highly cryptic but to birds. You can hardly see it. So believe it or not, there is actually one of these peppered moths just here in this photograph. Can't see it at all, right? Therefore, these are less prone to being predated upon by birds. Whereas the melanistic form here, this dark one here, um, is really, really obvious against that lichen. It shows up quite plainly, and therefore birds preferentially identify and eat the dark form relative to um, the light form when there's lots of lichen on the trees. If we look at the insect collections of the English aristocracy over the centuries, we find that this dark form is unsurprisingly rare in collections at least prior to the mid 1800s because it was subject to so much predation. Whenever this mutation occurred, it's less likely to survive because the dark form is very obvious and is likely to be eaten by birds. However, in the um, 1830s onwards, the industrial revolution was occurring and this led to unregulated smoke pollution, which in industrial cities such as Manchester led to trees being coated with soot. In such circumstances, the dark form is far better camouflaged, as you can see in this middle image here, than the light form. And that means that in areas where there's lots and lots of industrial pollution, the light form becomes rare and the dark form becomes um, more common because that light form is preferentially predated upon by per birds. So what we see in the collections of moths from around the 1830s onwards is that in polluted regions, as those marked on the map here, um, which are shown with these dark blobs, in these polluted regions, the dark form becomes dominant. It makes up more than 90% of the population by the turn of last century. That's not so true of the um, areas uh, where there are there is less heavy industry. And also note the preferential direction of the wind here blowing soot across the UK. However, that trend that we saw um, throughout um, the 1800s and the early 1900s is now beginning to reverse again with recent years uh, um, with the decline of heavy industry and the onset of pollution control. So these shifting populations of melanistic versus peppered uh, moths are a really fine example of natural selection at prey. At prey. <laughs> uh, at play is the word I was looking for there. Oh, I was, yeah. I obviously need more coffee. So the responses to selection are seen as adaptations to an environment. And I've put a definition of an adaptation on the slide for you here. 
The factors upon which selection is acting can be thought of as the selective pressure. So for example, the selective pressure in our peppered moths was the pollution changing the color of trees, therefore interrupting their encrypsis and changing the likelihood of predation. So we've got this idea of selective pressure. What is it that's driving the selection um, within these groups? Some adaptations, these results of selection are really, really impressive. So for example, there was clearly a strong selective pressure at play in the evolution of this leaf insect. So this leaf insect has evolved to look like a leaf because it's again, less likely to fall um, foul of predators if it's hard to see because it looks like a leaf. That's a strong example of a predation being a selective pressure within this group. Before I end this video, I just wanted to highlight that we have to consider other factors in addition to competition. One factor is behavior. This is a really fine example of a, um, of a uh, well, I suppose, uh, um, sorry, I suppose uh, uh, this is a form of competition in some regards, but we do need to consider all of these complex things that animals, as an example, do. And animals, undergo sexual reproduction. Mate choice can itself result in striking examples of differences in the appearance of males and females. These can inc include modifications to attract a mate, as shown on the left-hand side here, this fantastic peacock has developed this tail fan um, to try and attract a mate, to show that it is very, um, it's very uh, fit, for want of a better term. It's well suited to its environment and it can plow investment into this fantastic tail fan, um, which naturally doesn't really help it uh, survive in any, any other way. It will make it far harder for it to fly. That's an example of a thing called sexual selection at play. Um, and another example of sexual selection is um, when uh, organisms evolve uh, traits that are used in contests for the right to mate, such as the antlers on these moose or elk shown on the right hand side here. These are often very striking, these sexually selected traits, and they're very costly. And that emphasizes this role of behavior within, um, within evolution. And sexual selection is a really good example of that. So it's important to note that these may increase fitness, they may increase fecundity because of this behavioral element, but they do not necessarily increase survival. They're, some of them are very costly. So it's another um, complication we need to think about when we're thinking about how selection occurs in the living world. And with that, I will see you in our last video in which we're going to be looking at uh, speciation and evolutionary trees. So I'll see you there in just a second.